So Ted and I are old friends, and we've been taking our act on the road. Yes. We've been in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York together. That's right. We've done a lot of this. So I want to start off by asking you a simple question: What do you love about being an entrepreneur, and what do you hate about it? Um, well, what I love about it is the ability to redefine scale. I think that.、Um, That's probably in thinking of what the future of business is to be able to get ahead of each step function of exponential growth and change.、Um, early on, we got America Online. I was president of America Online. We were on a march to a million people. We wanted a million people to get online, and、uh, we envisioned a day where there'd be a hundred million people online. And then the next step function was from 100 million to who would get to a billion. Google and Facebook have now gotten to a billion users.、Um, then we envisioned mobile, and there's six and a half billion people who are subscribing to some kind of mobile device.、Um, now we're talking about Internet of Things connectivity, and five years from now there could be a trillion connections. So in a 25-year period. We literally would have gone from a million to a trillion, and no other time in human history has there been that kind of step function exponential change. So the idea of being able to create new products and services at each one of those major step ups is thrilling. So before you tell me what you don't like about being an entrepreneur, I want to ask a follow up question on. This scale issue, which I think is a, a very fascinating point, which is that as an entrepreneur, do you think that one of the reasons you were successful is that, as they say, how do you eat an elephant in small bites? You started and said a million, which seemed very ambitious. You didn't look at the whole U.S. and say, at that point, probably U.S. probably had 225 million people, maybe 250, something like that. If we're over 300 today,、yep. so you started. Small and incrementally grew your vision, whereas some would say some entrepreneurs kind of jump right in and they have these quote big hairy audacious goals and they go giant in a way that can actually cripple progress. So how how does one think about thinking big?、Um, well, I, I do think that as an entrepreneur,、um, you you envision a big platform. But you realize that it's the smallest first step, sometimes called the killer app, that's most important.、Um, I was an original investor in Google.、Uh, Google did the first deal with AOL. They were our search engine, and when we signed the deal, Sergey Brin said to me,、um, "We're just going to license you our search engine." And then it was, "Well, we're going to do mail." Um, I think we'll do like you've done. You own MapQuest. We'll do mapping. Just you have AIM, and we'll do Messenger, and and they did great work on each component, but it looked like it was a part of a big platform, and and platforms really are what win. I'm I'm associated with Brad and Eric、um, with Groupon. I was. Probably the first outside investor in the company. I'm chairman of the company.、Um, people think of Groupon as a desktop-oriented deal of the day email delivered offer. Couldn't be farther from the truth. It is a huge network that gets smarter with every transaction. Not unlike a Google. Not unlike an Amazon. It's about data science. And it's connected hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of merchants, with literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of shoppers. And now it's placing technology, like a platform company does. Doesn't it help, though, in some situations when it comes to growing? Businesses, especially new ideas, for them to be underestimated. So when you say people don't understand、yeah. what it actually is, maybe it's a good thing that they don't, right? Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. I think no one,、um, no one starts out, even though I'm sure Sergey and 
and Larry Page when they started Google envisioned that algorithms would rule and that if they could create the great search engine, that would be the front door to the web and that they could be in this distributed business where you come to Google, that's how you start your day. And you know, now they talk about toothpaste. Do you brush your teeth once a day, and now you brush your teeth twice a day. That's all they want you to do with Google. Two little transactions per day, a couple of billion per day. Um, so yeah, it's modest, but within the context of a, a big idea. So what don't you like about being an entrepreneur? Um, I think there's a, there's a notion right now that entrepreneurs are, um, are perhaps more important than individuals and founders uh, than they should be. I think we celebrate individuals too much. And when I, I look at, at companies, it's um, the best companies are able to get the collective culture and the collective thinking of lots of young people. And, and so when, when the focus goes on an individual, um, because we're human, sometimes you begin to fear failure. And most great companies, um, like people, will have reckonings. Um, we'll all have personal reckonings in the room. You'll, you'll have a health scare. Someone you love will break your heart. You'll have a financial setback. Something you believe in so much will, will prove not to be true. You, you'll have a reckoning. And companies have those reckonings. And it's from those great reckonings that the next big bounce happen. And, and one of the things that I don't like now is the kind of cult of celebrity around founder entrepreneurs and they get so built up that they tend to not want to innovate. And we're seeing in this mini bubble that's emerging too many derivative ideas, um, too many people pitching, we're going to be the Uber of, we're going to be the Google of. And, and I liked it better when you were young and, and not afraid to make mistakes. Tell me about one of your professional reckonings. Um, well, I had, a per I had a personal reckoning. You mentioned I wrote a book called The Business of Happiness, and uh, my dad's a Greek immigrant, and no one went to college. I was the first kid to go to college, and, and I was programmed, first generation, um, work real hard, go to a good school, get good grades. If you get good grades, you'll get a good job. If you get a good job, you'll make a lot of money. If you make a lot of money, you'll be successful, full stop. And, um, and so at a young age, I, I started my first company. I sold it when I was 24 years old and made $70 million. So I declared victory. I had won. And, um, and I lost my way, to be frank. And I then got on the wrong airplane. And as you read in my book, um, there's nothing more sobering than 35 minutes jettisoning fuel and coming in for an emergency landing. And, and I had a reckoning. I, I realized that um, all of the things that I would miss and what I was praying for had nothing to do with the achievements that you know, I had, had garnered in declaring victory. And so I, I made a list of 101 things to do before I die. You can go to my blog, Ted's Take, and see it. And it's very shallow. It's a, it's a young person's uh, groping for tools on how to live a life without regret, how to leave more than I take. And then um, I took my son to the, to the um, Library of Congress. And our country is a startup. We had great entrepreneur founders. And they wrote the Declaration of Independence. And at the Library of Congress, they have the red line versions of every line of the Declaration of Independence. It's really a breathtaking experience. Thomas Jefferson wrote a first draft, Ben Franklin edited it. It's all red line, and the only line in the whole document that wasn't edited was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which I found terrifying as a father because I was raising my son and daughter the same way I was raised. I never talked about 
happiness, about self-actualization. And there it was. It wasn't life, liberty, and the pursuit of stock options, life, liberty, and pursuit of, of property. And so I had a dual reckoning, and I committed that the second part of my life would be more about this theorem of if you're happy, you can be successful, and we know that if you're successful, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be happy, I'm sure. So what, what makes you happy then? Because um, that's different from... Well, I think there, there's a science of happiness. And, and by the way, the personal part of happiness translates very well into business. Um, so um, I, I, I participated in lots of studies. When I ran AOL, I did an online panel, 400,000 homes. I followed the Dalai Lama. Um, and it comes to five things. Um, first, that you're an active participant in multiple communities of interest. It's what Brad talked about. We're in a big community. We're social animals. Most successful product I ever launched was AIM. I had 300 million people using that product, never spent a penny in advertising. You're on the board of Starbucks. If you ask Howard, what business are you in? I'm in the community relations business. Our president ran for office, and his previous experience was he was a community organizer. Uh, communities of interest important. Facebook and Twitter have built huge franchises, eBay, based on community. Um, number two, that you have very high levels of self-expression. Um, we want to be heard. I've been married 28 years. The only time I get in a fight with my wife, you know what she says to me? You're not listening to me. Um, it's why I make movies. It's why I wrote books, why I invented a board game. I want to exercise that creative part of myself. As a company, if you can unleash the creativity of your customers, of your, of your employees, you build great value. Um, third, that you have very high levels of empathy. Um, empathy is the human emotion that's probably least understood, but most important, if you have high levels of empathy, they build memorials on the mall in Washington, D.C. The last mall that, um, last memorial opened on the mall was for Martin Luther King, Jr., Reverend King. Um, certainly had high levels of self-expression, the I Have a Dream speech, most meaningful, important speech delivered in my lifetime. He was a community organizer around civil rights. He had high levels of empathy. He predicted that he would be assassinated. And so as a leader, as a company, um, as an individual, showing and dialing up your empathy really builds a lot of value and moves you up that quadrant to self-actualization and happiness. Um, fourth, uh, as you get out of the I and into the we, it's an amazingly powerful thing. I, I own three sports teams. Um, teams win. You can have the best player, the highest scorer, you need teams. And when you get out of the eye and into the we, it's much easier to reflect back on that, that empathy. Um, and then last, that you find the higher calling in everything that you do. At AOL, we never once said, we were the number one performing stock for a decade, more than Microsoft, more than Apple during the 90s. When we went public, uh, we had a $400 million market cap. We ended at a $166 billion market cap when we bought Time Warner. Never once did we talk about um, revenues and sales. Our higher calling was to create a medium that was of higher value than the previous media, the telephone, the television that was launched before it. When we bought Time Warner, by the way, the first meeting I went to of all the managers being naive, I said, what's our, our higher calling? And Someone said $11 billion of EBITDA. <laughs> well, this isn't going to work. <laughs> it's, it's bad. <laughs> What's your higher calling in sports? So what um, is that when you're sure. so, you know, running a basketball? and? Obviously, we want to win, win a championship. Right. We want to make the playoffs. But honestly, uh, my higher calling is bringing the city closer together and making lifelong memories. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little vignette. Um, I, I grew up, as I said, my dad was a waiter, and, and he bought two season tickets to the New York Jets. 
they were $7 a ticket, $14 times seven games. And I'd go to church or Sunday school, and I'd run home, and my dad and I would take two subways to go to the games. And in 1969, the Jets won the Super Bowl, and that following Tuesday, there was a ticker tape parade. And my dad pulled me out of school. He took a day off, and we went to the parade. I remember sitting on his shoulders. Fast forward 80 years, and my dad died at 95 years old a couple of years ago in September, and that following January, the Jets were playing the Colts in the playoffs for the first time since 1969. Now they're the Indianapolis Colts. And I'm downstairs, I'm on the treadmill, I'm walking on the treadmill, and they put on the NFL Network, the 1969 Super Bowl game. And I start thinking about my father and thinking about the parade and I start crying, I have to hit pause, and I start weeping. And my wife comes down to go to the laundry room and she sees me sobbing, and she runs in and she says, are you okay? I'm like, my dad, Joe Namath. <laughs> she goes, you're pathetic. <laughs> I don't get it. And I go, that's the business I'm in. I want to make grown men and women cry 60 years <laughs> after the fact. What could be more noble than that? That's a great story. <laughs> great. So, we only have about a minute and a half left, and I'm going to ask you See, another big question. See, we should take this on the road, right? <laughs> <laughs> another big question. What fads are you seeing today that people are confusing with trends? Oh, that's interesting. Um, Social media. You think it's a fad? Yeah. Well, I, I don't see it as being, um, I don't see it as being like this enabling next thing. W what people don't realize is that in each of these categories, there's a zero-sum game winner. Um, and you just have to look historically. Microprocessors. Intel ended up, there's hundreds of transistor manufacturers. Intel ended up taking 120% of the profits from that industry. Everyone else was losing money. They were the zero-sum game winner. Early on, operating systems, obviously, Microsoft created that. Lots of people were trying to get into the atmospheric and be able to create software that platform. They were a zero-sum game winner. Google's got 88% of the search market. It's not a lot of room for anyone else. It's kind of over with Facebook. I, mean, I, I can't tell you how many plans I see and say, you know, Facebook's ready to go. And I go, why? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's become like oxygen, you know, get used to it. Twitter's like oxygen, get used to it. And so, so I don't see a lot of room now for the next social media platform. It'll be something that we dramatically done. different. Got it. Well, I could literally talk to you all night, but I could unfortunately night. we have a lot of other people that are going to join us uh, this evening. But thank you very much. I always learn something new from you every thank single you, time. Thank Ladies you. Ladies and gentlemen, Ted <laughs>